All right, hello everybody. Um, it seems there's another uh, talk going on. I don't know if you have heard about it, about Dwarf Fortress, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that explains. Uh, but thank you for coming to this talk. Um, the idea is to talk a bit about my journey through the development of Kaita, a, a bunch of roguelites that I have been developing through the years, and basically the experience that I have had there, and maybe how it could help you finish your games. Uh, how many of you are Roglia developers? All right, quite a bunch. <laughs> so yeah, uh, I'm going to just start because time is pretty short. Uh, what, what happened here? Let, later? <laughs> is it the end? So thank you for coming. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so this was me when I started doing roguelikes like about five, 15 years ago or something like that. Um, I still don't have like a big roguelike, like, right? Like a famous roguelike that thousands of people are playing, but so what I want to share is this experience that I have had and how it could help you probably. Um, so yeah, you can find all my games at slashy.net. There's a huge list there that I have put. And so I started around 2003, 2004, when I went to the college. So by that time, I, got, I, I, I was able to play Adom, right? And it really inspired me into doing roguelikes. And at first, I tried to do like a, replicate what Adom is, and especially Jade, which was the project that Thomas Beast could have by, by that time. Uh, so I wanted to create like a very complex simulator of the medieval fantasy, right? So like a complete world that you could play on. And that's what I went in uh, for at first, right? And it was, um, I did not have the experience to carry that, but I jumped straight into it. Uh, by then we had the Usenet uh, Rogla development channel. It was like the primary communication channel that we had. And I was not alone. There was a lot of people that was trying to do just that, right? Like you recreate like the very complex simulation of a world, but we're, we, we were not really thinking on doing a game, right? We were thinking on doing like a sandbox where you could like play and then the game will rise. So I played, uh, I mean, I, I worked uh, a long time on that, like trying to get that done um, until I got to the seven day roguelite challenge, which was like a turning point for me. That was around 2005. Um, so in this talk, I want to talk about all the different seven day roguelites that I have done, right? And how each one of these uh, kind of taught me something that I could use in, in the next one. And finally in my current project, which is Ananias and, and how it may help to you too for this. All right, so the first one I made was Castlevania Roguelike. I actually um, developed it further after the seven day Roguelike challenge. And so I had been working already for like two years on the other one and still didn't manage to produce anything. So I jumped into the challenge thinking that it was like a waste of time because seven days is very little time. So, but in the end I managed to ship a game. Well, it was a game, it was playable. It was not very fun, it was not very complete, uh, but I managed to like say, hey, this is my game. I finally made a game, and I think this is, that's a very important step, like being able to chip something, because else you just keep working and working on, on demons or, or technical stuff and never get feedback from, from anyone. So um, another thing that I, that I learned for this one is uh, that I could focus in a like, single uh, feature that was fun and for example, this one didn't even have procedural generation. So it was like a more of a, well, it had ASCII art, so that looked a bit like a roguelike, but it didn't have a lot of other factors. Mm. But still, it's like an initial step. So I think it, that's a good uh, thing that you can do is uh, like have a work incrementally, right? Like having a first iteration of your game and then continue developing on it. Um, Next year, I did Drash Roguelike, which is uh, based on the and very old Ultima game, which is called Escape from Mount Drash. 
The first thing I did there is that I reutilized the code from Castlevania, and this time I did include procedural generation. So uh, it was like a more, more close to what a role like really is. Another thing that I did for this one is I, this, I established some design guidelines from the beginning, so I knew what I wanted, right? So I had a plan instead of just trying to do uh, and see what, what can come up. I, I knew from the beginning that I didn't want to have experience points, didn't have to be grinding or, or doing that stuff, and that the, everything was going to be like uh, without commands, without menus, without anything like that. So that also helps a bit. And actually for this one, I had a completely different plan by, by the beginning of the, of the challenge. Uh, I wanted to create like a simulator of an ant colony. So you could like be an ant fighter and defend the colony from invaders or something like that. And in the end, well, I did some research on the different types of ants and it, I mean, I could not find like a way to make it like a, into a funny mechanic, right? So I changed what I was planning to do and ended up with like just a survival arena um, and it worked much better. So this, this one was actually pretty fun to play, uh, unlike Castlevania Rogue, which was not very good. <laughs> then the same year, I created another one, which is, was called Metroid Roguelike. And this one, I think what I did was, again, reutilizing the code. But I really uh, invested a lot of time in the world generation. So this is, uh, in this one, I created like a base, so similar to the Metroid games. And you had to explore the different areas of the base and find a power up and then go to another part of the base and use that power up. So it was like backtracking and it was randomly generated. So I think that was pretty good. Um, I, I also included like additional features which apart from, random, from procedural generation, which were like the pseudo 3D. So it was still an overhead view, but each cell had a different height. So you could jump and get into different uh, parts of the world. And finally, another thing that I included was the background music, which I think is uh, maybe it was present in other games, but I think Doom Roguelike was like the first one to like really um, innovate with that. And I think it's a huge uh, help like to create a mood for the games. So as you can see, I was like reutilizing or, or using uh, existing universes, so Castlevania, Ultima, uh, Metroid. And that helped, of course, like to get the music because I could go into the internet and find it and without having to have an artist for it. So that's also a very helpful. Next year, I had Zelda Roguelike. Again, I worked more on the procedural generator. I added like a overworld generator which generated like forests and lakes and mountains based on the dungeon that you were going to explore and also um, created like more complex dungeon generator. So again, like incrementally going so, so that I could be adding new complexity. It was, I mean, it was complete but it was a bit unbalanced. And the thing here is, yeah, as I, as, as I told you, uh, I think including elements for um, a really established universe like Zelda or Metroid or, or Castlevania, of course, helps you get people into the game and get, gets you feedback. And I think the most important thing uh, up to this point is learning, right? So maybe initially you want to create like a huge game to have people like to, I mean, you have a vision and you want people to, 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 to uh, experience what you want but you still don't know how to make a good game, right? So you can end up like walking in circles like trying to make the game while you still don't really know how to make a game. So this, I mean, I, I think the way that I did it allowed me to learn, to get feedback, and to like move on, right? Because these games were, most, most of them, I developed them for the seven day roguelike challenge and then forgot about them. So they were like more like learning experiences. So I was not completely invested into them uh, with a few exceptions, uh, but they, they were more like a one-time thing that I will get some uh, experience, also uh, develop some algorithm that I, I, I could reutilize later in other projects, but mainly the experience was the, the part. Uh, so if you are using an existing universe, um, 
you can get feedback from the players and that helps you like become better in game design and in and the programming itself. Next year, Mega Man roguelike. Uh, I tried to create a side-scrolling turn-based roguelike. It didn't end up very well <laughs> <laughs> because it was pretty, complica pretty complex, so you didn't know what was going on. Um, since it was turn-based, so when you jump, you stand in the air, and then you pass your turn, and you continue going up like another tile, and then you fall back again. And then you can shoot with your arm cannon, but the, the bullets don't immediately go. They are also objects in, in the world. So you have to keep track and try to hit your enemies, like calculating when they're going to hit. It was, uh, I had the, the idea to do it, and uh, that's the point of this one experimenting with stuff, right? Sometimes you have an idea and you think it's great, but it ended up not being that great like in, the, in reality. So, so yeah, ex experimentation, I think it's also important, but again, experimenting in a small scale so you can, all right, that was a failure, complete failure, let's move on and forget that it happened. So, yeah. All right, 2009 was Expedition. Um, this one was based on Seven Cities of Gold and, and Colonization, which are like uh, games about creating a colony in the new world. Uh, this one I really want, to, I, that's, uh, this is also an idea that I had for a while. And I, I decided to try to do it in the seven day roguelike challenge, uh, but it was huge, right? So it was impossible to have it done b by that time. Um, I didn't manage to implement the procedural generation, so we just had like a high resolution map that you could uh, travel around and, and put the, the settlements on. Um, so another lesson, lesson here was to watch out for the scope, right? Especially, I mean, if you're starting, you, you, you want to like go with small iterations. 2010 was ruler. It was similar to Expedition, but it was more like um, the influence was more from civilization. So you had like a civilization that you could um, advance through the different ages and create more powerful units. And the, le the lesson I got from this one was that I really, I mean, you need to really invest uh, into play testing, right? I didn't get to play test until the very last and it ended up being completely broken, right? So you could get into the space age very quickly and then the game was broken. So I implemented a lot of infrastructure, right? Like technically you could like create cities, create roads between them, trade, do a lot of stuff. But the game itself, I mean, trying to play the game was completely broken. So, and you don't want to create that, that right? You want your games to be playable. So play testing, uh, like having some friends help you play test your game. Now, well, we have internet, we have like an easier way to con connect with people and have that happen uh, because, well, you want to make the best use of your time, right? And if you, what you do is developing, then you really need someone to help you test. 2000, uh, 2011, 2011, right, was Elite International Detective. This one was like influenced by where in the world is Carmen San Diego. So it was supposed to be like a roguelike, but you were traveling the world and trying to find Carmen San Diego, but you found like um, detectives that were, would shoot, shoot you down. So you had guns and you had to kill them actually and try to find, find her. Um, and this one, what, what was missing was quality content, right? So all the, all the engine was there. Uh, I managed to test it, right? Uh, it worked, it was, it was stable, but I didn't have in mind the quantity of content that was required to make this interesting. So, for example, in this one, well, I needed like a database of cities and countries and uh, like features from this country so that it would be interesting, like trying to find the clues to get to the next country, and I didn't have that. Even though I had someone uh, try to help me, so it, it didn't happen. So in the end, the experience that people had was not very good. 2012 was Hope. I tried, as you can see, all of the, all of the, the previous one were console mode, right? So only characters. 
So for the first time, I tried doing, doing graphics. But I didn't have, I, I am not a pixel artist. And I did not have a, like a good pixel artist. Um, so yeah, you need to have like someone skilled because else it didn't have pretty well. Uh, it was not very aesthetically pl pleasing, right? And if you're going for graphics, you need it to be pleasing. I think so, because if you're doing just a, like a console mode, well, we know that what kind of players will, will play, right? And they, they, they have the imagination to think what's going on and to fill the gaps. But if you're going for graphics, you are targeting a much larger audience. And they have different expectations. So they expect to be more clear what's going on. Uh, so there's no, let, I mean, going for a middle ground is not going to be please anyone. So, yeah. All right, so up to this time, I had, I had used Java. And I have not had like a lot of exposure because it was hard for people to run the games. So in 2013, I got, uh, I started doing JavaScript games. This one was the first, name was Rodney. So the lesson here was like, yeah, I had to close that cycle because really, I mean, I had learned a lot and everything I learned was very useful for me for my uh, professional life, right, everything. But really that wasn't working for games. So I closed that cycle and decided to change things. And actually in Rodney, the, the bosses of the dungeon are Glenn, Ken, and also Michael, who is not here. So if you can go all the way down to the dungeon, you, can, you have to kill them to win. So good luck. <laughs> uh, other things that I included in this one was a single action button. So there, there are no commands. You just move around and use a single action button. And it's all based on the skills. So for example, moving around, you trigger the skills. If you have the wall jump skill, you just run into a wall, and then it gets triggered when you actually run into it. Yeah, so that was, that was also uh, an important thing there, the recapitulation, simplification. So I just went through like all my previous games or game uh, efforts and, and try to see, okay, so let's see what's good in this. And let's try to get some features from there that, that work, simplify them and bring them into something new. So that's what I did. Another important point here is the accessibility. Again, the, my previous games were not very accessible. And I think that's a goal that I put myself, like made my following games accessible. 2014 was Ananias, the seven day roguelike version. It was made for touch devices. Um, yeah, it was like my first mobile game. Um, and it was also the first time that I decided to use a library instead of like trying to do some, everything from scratch. So I think the lesson for this one was like creating a, an experience target to a specific platform, right? Basically, I, I did it because there were no good mobile games, mobile roguelikes. Uh, I don't know if, if any of you has um, developed a mobile roguelike, but it's very different than, than doing a, a roguelike for desktop, right? So the ports we had for roguelikes um, were very difficult to play because you had a lot of commands. It was not made for that. I'm going to just move this here. So yeah, I found that there, that was like something that needed to be done better and went for it. 2015, Studio Abyss. So first time I teamed with someone to, to do the seven day roguelike challenge. He basically did uh, all the 3D display code. It was a 3D dungeon crawler. Um, and I did the, the dungeon generation, which was based on Ultima Underworld. So it generates levels like similar to Ultima Underworld. Uh, we had a hard time getting the graphics. So you can get an ar artist on board. You, you will be in much better shape. And I really had a lot of fun doing the procedural generator. So I think one thing here is like focusing on what you can really uh, provide the most value, right? So teaming up with someone, with someone, getting an artist, having someone work in the display code, have, you can work in a different component of the game. Uh, it ended up pretty, pretty well, but um, again, it was not very fun. 
it was fancy because, I mean, I don't know if any of you has played Ultima Underworld. So, yeah, uh, that game was like uh, very important for me. And it creates levels like Ultima Underworld. But yeah, so they are empty because you don't have a plot. And what you have to do in the game is like explore these huge levels and try to find a, st a single tile, which is the stairway to the next level. And you can easily get lost. So I also stuck to, um, I had like, this idea that getting lost is good, right? And that players should not complain about it, but rather try not to. So for example, people um, suggested that I add in an, an auto map, right? And I say, no, I don't want to, I will not do that because that will break what I want, my, like my vision for the game. But it made the game like unplayable, right? Because yeah, no one will like wander around for two hours in a single level looking for a tile, right? Like a small tile and also the dungeon is dark. So, so yeah, you, you gotta listen sometimes to, to people if you want to make a game that someone else will play. I mean, I, I play it and I, uh, I have the patience to go through, but most people won't, won't do that. Um, finally, this year I made this one. It's made for smart watches, so yeah, exploring new medias and new technologies. I was thinking on either doing that or virtual reality, but I didn't know. Didn't have like the technological stack to do the VR, so it's a simple game that you can play in your smartwatch. It's like a very simplified uh, version of the roguelike formula, but it works well. I mean, if you're waiting for your bus or, some, or something, you can just try to get as far as you can in your in the tower. So yeah, this, that's like the story. I think I'm running out of time. Finally, for the future, uh, Ananias is what I'm working on. So I evolved from 2014, and I am almost ready to hit Steam. So I think the most important lesson is like uh, going, I mean, being able to um, stand in one point of time and looking back and seeing, OK, so I've done all this. I will take all the lessons I have learned and I will apply them to my new projects instead of like keeping like doing the same again and again because it's very easy I think to to fall into the trap of never releasing and keeping working on on your game um, so yeah you're welcome to keep in touch and uh, Ananias is already available so you can download it for for Android and iOS uh, not not iOS yet but soon but you can download for Android and desktop, and we'll be releasing soon in, uh, in Steam, so that's the idea to do it the next month. It's a roguelike that keeps the spirit of the classic roguelike, so it's turn-based, permanent, what, what's the new name? <laughs> Consequence persistence. Consequence persistence, <laughs> fully certified by the, by, the, the, by the original developers of Rogue. Um, <laughs> So yeah, uh, that's what I wanted to share. I don't know if you have any questions. Um, so after 13 times of having a development cycle the last seven days, um, how do you feel like we should divide up the seven days? How much time in design and development? Mm -hmm. OK. So can you watch it? So after this whole uh, participation on the seven day roguelike challenge, how do I think that I should split like those seven days into the different uh, kinds of tasks for, for to, to release something that is good? I think uh, it's important to have time for place tasting so that usually I keep like the last day for that, like to do play tasting, uh, play testing, excuse me, and doing any tweaks that are needed. You need at least two days for data, right? Like to put interesting data, monster data, items, uh, quest. So, so that is going to be like a, an important, uh, like a fun game. And yeah, I mean, it's a very short span of time. So the rest of the time you have to, to, to be coding. Um, most, I mean, especially for the first time that you participate, the result is not going to be very good, but the, important part is the experience of like having this compressed uh, development cycle because developing a game normally takes much longer, right? But you are compressing everything into seven days so you can 
uh, have the experience of having developed a, a whole game, forgetting that, moving, moving on to the next. So you can like gain those skills more quickly. Well, I, I think that the important point there is listening to what people think, right? So that's like a, my main uh, source of f finding out what worked and what didn't work, uh, the feedback that I got from the players. And that's also an important part of the 7 DRL is that you get a lot of feedback, especially in recent years, like about fr four years, um, the last four years, we have had a lot of exposure so there's been like, I don't know, about 200 and more entries. And there's a lot of people like looking into your games. So that helps you like get the feedback. And I think that's like the most important metric. All right. Thank you.